life according to other people's expectations. Because not only is it unkind to you, but it's unkind to them because you'll never be able to fulfill their desires. Because no matter how much you, f you, you follow the pattern of what they want, you'll always, you'll always fall short. So the only, the only wise thing you can do is to follow what you know is right and, and by being true to yourself, just trust they'll catch up later. <laughs> it took about ten years, but it, we made it. <laughs> so, Lo, said Mara, I am the Lord, the wise sovereign of all creatures, knowing ease and ill and understanding the cause of them in the world, so that thou, O glorious hero, he's such a smarmy blighter, isn't he? Thou, O glorious hero, mayest have good health in the days of thy, thy youth, enjoy the pleasures of men, and live in thy father's house. Dwell in the great joyous and rich sea-girt land, O Gotama, rule thy realm, offering the great sacrifices, the horse sacrifice, the human sacrifice, the white lotus sacrifice, the sacrifice of the unbarred house. After thou hast offered these sacrifices, thou wilt become an immortal god. Do thou, my friend, listen then, and do as I say, lest you go astray in the future through abandoning the joys of this present world. These were the verses Mara spoke before the Bodhisattva, and to him speaking thus the Bodhisattva made reply. The pleasures of the senses are despicable, without happiness, and the discerning man will see no profit therein, for that is the way to hell, to the brutes, to the world of Yama, who is the, the judge of the dead, and to the world of Yama with its many ghosts. Those whose desires are wrong, who delight in lust, are utterly sunk in darkness and without sight and bereft of light. Such are the men who pursue sensual desire. It is a foul-smelling, fetid, ignoble thing, this body. Pure men take no delight therein. The fool may turn his own peculiar thoughts to it, but the wise man will not set his heart thereon. <coughs> so this whole um, passage here is, this is um, the, the Buddha um, uh, speaking in, in a kind of counterpoint to the uh, the, the voice of Mara, which is always urging towards in, involvement in the sense world, attachment to the sense world and sense pleasure in particular. And there's many discourses of the Buddha where he goes into the, the danger, and some of them are quite, quite hilarious really, the similes he comes up with with the, um, what sense pleasures are like and what they, what they bring you to. Um, hilarious in a sort of black humor, <laughs> a blackly humorous way. But it's a very common theme and it's not because the, you know, the Buddha is a, is a kind of life denier, but simply having seen that the pursuit of pleasure does not lead to happiness, it leads to a greater addiction and more misery and despair because he followed that way himself and so he knows that it just takes more time and more energy and you get more dragged out and more despairing and, and, and uh, further and further in and just upping the dose does not do the trick. <coughs> Um, so it's because he's seen that himself that he, he, uh, he, he's clearly aware that pursuing sense pleasure is not the way to happiness. There's a degree of gratification, but it just in pursuing sense pleasure merely increases your, your capacity for, for that hunger. And then there is a very interesting sentence here. As when during a thunderstorm the lightning strikes a field of luxuriant ripe rice, so because of sensual pleasures do states of the highest good become fruitless. That's interesting in terms of we can put a lot of effort into say spiritual practice and developing <coughs> concentration and, and wholesome states of mind. But then if if we then it's like we build up a lot of, of good karma and, and kind of beautiful states of mind in that way, but then he he compares it like lightning striking a, a field of, of, of ripe rice. That if then we go and, and waste our energy or, or burn our, our, our energy in, in kind of um, shallow or senseless pursuit of pleasure, just kind of wasting our time, just pursuing distraction, then it's like this wonderful fertile field full of richness is <laughs> rendered useless by, by kind of burning our, our capacity, our spiritual uh, wealth. Ordinary men indeed pursue what is base, blind and unawakened, they are excited by passion, they are excited because their minds are unawakened. 
As when a prince has got rid of his foe, he can enjoy freedom, prosperity and glory, so may one who does not pursue the base delights of the senses win the good proclaimed by the conqueror. As when dry excrement burns with a repulsive and most foul smell, a king's son is not happy there, so sensual pleasures are vile to the wise. As in the last month of summer, salt water may cause thirst in men. It's like when, when wells, the wells start to dry up, when the wells get low, then that you get saltiness in the water. So does the wretched man who pursues the pleasures of sense in his ignorance constantly increase his craving. I think we've all familiar with this pattern. The more you want, the more you want. Then he goes into the um, what is known as the contemplations of the unattractiveness of the body, um, bringing the point home. As for the humours in liver, kidneys and lungs and other secretions that arise in the body and run out through openings on its surface, the wise will have no joy therein, especially when you, didn't, when you put it like that. <laughs> there are snot and spittle, room, phlegm and bile attended by headache. They flow without ceasing, unclean and vile. The wise man will have no joy therein. Because of sensual desire, men suffer manifold woes in headlong ruin, in states of ill, as beans and pulses when gathered in a pot, so do men shrivel up in the hells. He who through lack of, suff lack of understanding generates a craving for sensual pleasures is carried away and deluded by forms. Thus, he of, uh, of himself seeks after the source of the disease that brings ill, just as a jackal seeks a corpse in a cemetery. There's also a, a little passage um, from another sutta where the Buddha says, um, There are forms, bhikkhus, cognizable to the eye, agreeable, pleasing, charming, endearing, fostering desire, enticing. If a monk relishes them, welcomes them and remains fastened to them, he is said to be a monk fettered by forms cognizable to the eye. He has gone over to Mara's camp, he has come under Mara's power, the evil one can do with him as he will. Uh, so what, what the, is being described here is, is what happens when we uh, habituate the mind to finding happiness through, through sense pleasure. It's particularly like the pursuit of sense pleasure. Not, and this doesn't mean sort of look, not, you know, enjoying looking at a sunset. You know, so he's talking about Mara's put in front of him all these kind of alluring forms and so the Buddha responds to, to Mara's kind of um, bait, if you like, with a corresponding, correspondingly strong a counterpoint to that. Um, and by pointing out this is what happens when you pursue sense pleasure as a goal in life, you end up with this, um, in this hell realm of, of uh, despair and, and addiction, constant craving. And that um, the um, the heart becomes completely bound by that and fettered by that, so that, in like in this last passage, there you know that there it's true there is a gratification, it's, and he also goes on to, to do the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the mind. That there is a gratification, a pleasurable to the senses. There is a kind of deliciousness there, but then uh, if that's where we invest our heart, if that's where we put place our hope then it's like you're in Mara's realm. It's like the heart is, 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 is um, bound to, to Mara's realm. And then as he says, it's kind of excruciating phrase, and then the, the evil one can do with him as he likes. <laughs> Gone over to Mara's side. And so again, this is a kind of graphic mythological form. But I think we can, we can experience that when we've really invested our heart in wanting something or, or getting caught up with something of, of some kind of addiction that we, we have in the sense world and then you know it's like we've gone in so far we can't get out of it and like a master master Xu and Hua uses this, this, this um, simile because it's like a porcupine going up a land drain you know a porcupine <laughs> when a porcupine wanders into a land drain it kind of it's very easy to get in but do you call them land drains here, like a water pipe? Yeah. Like a, like in the, uh, yeah, culvert. A culvert, like a, in the, when you're draining land, you have these water pipes. And so the critters often kind of look in and see, oh, what's up there? And then 
porcupine can get in, but then it wants to revert out. It's difficult to get out. <laughs> okay. But Mara could achieve nothing against the Bodhisattva, and he and his army were defeated and fled in all directions. Their elation gone, their toil rendered fruitless, their rocks, logs, and trees scattered everywhere. They behaved like a hostile army whose commander had been slain in battle. So Mara, defeated, ran away together with his followers. The great seer, free from the dust of passion, victorious over darkness, his gloom had vanquished him, and the moon like a maiden's gentle smile lit up the heavens while a rain of sweet-scented flowers sprinkled with dew fell down on the earth from above. Alone he vanquished Mara and his multitudes holding no sword or knife in his hands, not having girt himself with armies round about. Most worthy of praise indeed, is it not? <coughs> so in this version, this is the, the, the time of the moment of enlightenment comes here. That the Buddha has conquered Mara by this point. Um, okay, so then again we um, we come back to the daughters who have another go. Uh, this is a, from a different uh, different recension, and um, this is similar to the uh, the Pali version where. Actually, the, the daughters of Mara don't appear until well after the Enlightenment. It's kind of in, the, in the weeks after the Enlightenment, they, they kind of wade in and have a go to, to try and uh, disrupt the Buddha's life. This is a Pali one, no? Yes. From the Jataka Nidana. At that time, craving discontent and lust, three daughters of Mara who were looking for him, saying, Our father is not to be seen. Where can he now be found? They saw him, dejected as he was, scribbling on the ground. <laughs> Seeing him, they ran to their father and asked him, Father, why are you so sad and downhearted? <coughs> my dears, this great summoner has now passed beyond my control. I have watched for so long, yet have not been able to see an opportunity of seizing him. Therefore, I am sad and downhearted. If that be so, do not vex yourself. We will bring him under our power and lead him to you. No, my dears, no one can bring, him under, can bring him under my power. This man is firmly established in his unwavering faith. But dear father, we are women. We will ensnare him in such bonds as the passions and bring him to you. Do not be worried. Having said this, drawing near to the Blessed One, they said to him, O oh, Samna, we will attend on you as your wives. The Blessed One neither paid any attention to what they said nor opened his eyes to look at them. As his heart had reached the state of perfect emancipation on the destruction of all material clingings, he sat there experiencing the bliss of absolute calm. So this is the, 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 the clingings, the, um, the types of clinging that we went, like we went through this afternoon is uh, the clinging of sense desire, the clinging to views and opinions, the clinging to conventions, like um, attachment to conventions, rites, rituals, um, etc., and attachment, clinging to the sense of self, atavadu padana. They said, the daughters, this is, when beautiful springtime came, while all the trees, and by the way, Venerable Kanti Palo's poetry is not, not so, so fantastic, so you have to. Appear, you have to forgive some uh, slight clumsiness in his um, recensions here. When beautiful springtime came, while all the trees were in bloom, we came that we may be happy, uniting with you, possessor of wonderful marks. We have faces like the moon when full, we have eyes like open lotuses. We charm the hearts of the gods, for we are perfect creatures. More fragrant than wood of sandal and adorned with various jewels, we came that we may be happy while you and we are still young. Deign to glance at us, desirable ones, who have lips like the right bimba, breasts strong and protruding and dual umbilical cords in our navels. Which was obviously a big turn-on in India. <laughs> <laughs> 1700 years ago. But, uh, it's kind of gone out of fashion, I think, nowadays. <laughs> Unless I'm missing something. <laughs> It is hard to attain unto Bodhi. Don't stop because you will be Buddha. 
That's like, don't stop getting involved in sexual activity because you'll be Buddha. Don't stop because you will be Buddha. We are hard to meet even if we make an appointment. <laughs> this guy is not a poet, am I? Come, we have agreed. Let us now be happy. To meet with beautiful maidens and yet with them not to be happy is like a fool seeing a treasure but from foolishness leaving it there. <coughs> When they danced and sung in this and many other ways, he, calm and firm, his limbs unmoving, and with a smiling appearance, spoke in a voice which pleases the heart and is more melodious than the voice of Brahma and the singing of the Kala Vinka bird, one of the celestial, celestial birds. Such lust is the root of suffering, it leads such fools to evil. Enjoyment with beautiful women is like drinking brine and becoming more thirsty. Never sated are men enjoying these things. But long have I discarded them, escaping from their slavery, as a man flees a burning furnace or a poisonous drug. Again, this is, you know, it's interesting to note that it's not because he's kind of condemning pleasure as such, but just that sense pleasure is, just produces so much suffering because it continually betrays what it promises, like the advertising industry. <laughs> you know, it promises a lot and it doesn't deliver very much. New and depraved. <laughs> New and depraved. For it is by continuing in deceitful pleasures that a man acquires the infections of folly and evil, neither profiting himself nor able to profit others. Therefore I desire not these things, them I cast away. It is these pleasures that burn up all living beings, even as the fire at the eon's end burns the world. This is the traditional you know, co pattern of the cosmos, that the, the, the universe, is, the world is destroyed by either fire or flood or wind. And, and this particular eon is, we're supposed to end by being burned up in fire, absorbed into the, the fire element. They are perishable as a bubble rising on the water, unreal as a dream, unsubstantial as a phantom, hollow and false, deceiving the worldly wise. But the man of true wisdom finds no delight in them. Just as you see a, just as you see a child with his playmates playing and making himself dirty in the mud, so is the ignorant and besotted man dirtied by these. He sees the dazzling sheen of the jeweled trinket and straightway rises in him covetous, des covetous desire. As to that hair of yours which grows out of your heads, what dirt it stores, what sores it generates, your teeth shed in secret one by one. <laughs> <laughs> now he really gets underway. Your lips and nose and mouth and eyes are as a bubble is for impermanence, and the crowns of your heads down to the soles of your feet with much blood and pus you are filled, darling. From your bodies, generally speaking, filth oozes from the nine openings. The man who delights in these is foolish as one making a millstone to grind his own body. Therefore, all who are wise and can discriminate will reject and leave behind such false delights. Though the world were filled with, be with beauties like yourselves, even ten eons together with them would not rouse lust in me. The pure-hearted one, my mind, like the clear and pure sky. Then again the daughters of Maya went up to the exalted one six times and saying, O monk, we will attend on you as your wives. Each one having miraculously presented herself in a hundred different guises of virgins, as women who have not yet begotten children, who have given birth to one child, had two children, or women in middle age, or elderly women, thinking to themselves, varied are the desires of men. <laughs> <laughs> they did their best. <laughs> Let them not be chided for their lack of effort and ingenuity. Thinking to themselves, varied are the desires of men. Some are attracted by virgins, some by women in the prime of youth, some by women in middle age, and others by older women. Let us then entice them in all possible ways. They didn't try boys, but never mind. <laughs> I think it had the same effect. And the exalted one paid no attention even to that, for he had gained release on the complete can uh, on the complete destruction of clingings to the body. And he preached to them a discourse of the following two stanzas dealing with his destruction of defilements. Of whom victory cannot become defeat, and of the conquered none can follow him. That Buddha, traceless of infinite range, by which track will you lead him? 
in whom there is not an entangling craving, unembroiling and not anywhere to lead that Buddha traceless of infinite range, by which track will you lead him? And this is, uh, also echoes back to that phrase that um, we touched on this morning, as you may properly recall, that um, when the Buddha is having his first nose-to-nose with Mara, and he says, um, there are ascetics and Brahmins that have surrendered here and they are seen no more. They do not know the paths the pilgrim travels by. That phrase. And this, this whole um, quality of tracklessness is an image that, that comes up just as we were talking about the unapprehendability of the Buddha and this quality of tracklessness, like a bird. Often the, the Buddha would describe an enlightened being like a bird in flight, leaves no track. Then uh, and again, the enlightened ones are, are trackless. They leave no trace as they go. So then we come back to the, um, the Pali Canon, and again this is um, uh, in that, in the, in the Pali, these um, come shortly after the Enlightenment, but these same verses have been in the later stories have been immersed in the, the, the Night of Enlightenment story. And these are particularly interesting because this is after the, the you know, that the Buddha's already firmly established in, in the enlightened, uh, enlightened state, but you've got Mara is really still going at him. And uh, again, to remind you that Mara is like the voice of doubt, or the voice of, of the self-sense that kind of continually welling up in the Buddha, so that these voices of Mara here, if you like, think of this as like your own doubts when you're into your you know, day six of a retreat, or, or kind of week five <laughs> with seven weeks ahead and you're already counting the hours <laughs> so this is, these are the voice, voices of doubt um, and, uh, and uh, self-concern that, that well up in the mind that, that the wisdom faculty has to, to meet and, and work with Mara the evil one has been following the blessed one for seven years looking for an opportunity but finding none then he went to the Blessed One and addressed him in stanzas. Do you now dream in woods, immersed in sorrow? Have you lost your wealth? Are you pining for it? Is there some crime done by you in the town? Why do you make no friends among the people? Is there none that you can call a friend? The root of sorrow is dug out of me. Unsorrowing, I meditate in innocence. And free of taints, O oh cousin of the careless, as one real of all hankering for being. So Mara's coming along and saying, you know, there is, you really, there must be something wrong with you. I mean, here you are, you're out here in the woods alone, everyone's abandoned you, you know, you left your family, and, and then the, the, uh, the five ascetics, they dumped you and walked out, and jolly good thing too, and here you are kind of drifting around like some airhead in the woods, <laughs> pretending you're an enlightened being, and who do you think you are? You know, you, you, haven't, you haven't got a friend in the world. What kind of accomplishment is this? <laughs> <laughs> he gets around. The root of sorrow is dug out of me. So then you notice in this, in this verse that the Buddha replies that he's, he, he uses me, I'm sorrowing, I meditate in innocence. So then Mara, being incredibly quick off the mark, says, okay, shh. And he picks up on the fact that the Buddha's been using personal pronouns. <laughs> <laughs> the things of which men say, it is mine, and men who utter the word mine, if you have thoughts allied to these, you cannot then escape me, monk. And the Buddha responds, things they call mine, I call not so. I am not one of those so saying. Hear this then, evil one. The path I know you cannot even see. Again, this is the uh, same as the, the tracklessness of the Buddha, as he mentioned before. Now, Mara knows this is true. So then, as any good negotiator, when he sees that one doorway closed, he immediately tries to find another one. And he says, If you have truly found a path that leads in safety to the deathless, depart, but go by it alone. What need to let another know? <laughs> so this is like the temptation for him not to bother teaching. You know, 
Why, why, why do you have all that hassle? People are so stupid. Why bother with them? People who seek to cross beyond ask me where death cannot prevail. Thus asked, I tell the end of all, where is no substance for rebirth. <coughs> so, you know, already within the heart of the Buddha there's this disposition to, to compassionate action. So, regardless of Mara's attempt to persuade him, he is not even bothered by that and, uh, and says, you know, if there are people to teach, then I'll teach them. Then Mara, in this, this um, very poignant little piece, says, Suppose, Lord, not far from a town or a village, there were a pond with a crab in it, and a party of boys or girls went out from the town and the village to the pond, and they went into the pond and pulled the crab out of the water, set it on the dry land, and whenever the crab extended a leg, they cut it off, broke it, and smashed it with sticks and stones, so that the crab, with all its legs cut off, broken, and smashed, would be unable to get back to the pond as before. So too, all Mara's distorting, parodying, and travestying have been cut off, broken, and smashed by the Blessed One. And now I cannot get near the Blessed One any more when I seek an opportunity. Then Mara uttered these stanzas of disappointment in the Blessed One's presence. Step by step for seven years I followed the Blessed One, the fully enlightened one, possessed of mindfulness. He gave me no chance. A crow there was who walked around a stone that seemed to be a lump of fat. Shall I find something soft in this? Is there something tasty here? He, finding nothing tasty there, made off, and we from Gotama depart in disappointment too, like the crow that tried the stone. Full of sorrow, he let his lute slip from under his arm, and then the unhappy demon vanished. Now when Mara the evil one had spoken these stanzas of disappointment in the Blessed One's presence, he left that place and sat down cross-legged on the ground, not far from where the Blessed One was, silent, dismayed, with shoulders drooping and head down, glum and with nothing to say, scraping the ground with a stick. <laughs> then, here they go again, Tanha, Arati and Raga, the daughters, went to him and spoke to him in stanzas. And this is what we've just had before. Father, why are you disconsolate? Whom are you brooding over? We can catch him. Setting a snare of lust will tie him up just as they catch a forest elephant and bring him back into your power. Mara by this time realizes he's met his match and been surpassed. An arahant sublime is in the world and when a man escapes from Mara's sphere there are no wiles to lure him back again by lust and that is why I grieve so much. And Tanha, Arati and Raga went to the Blessed One and they said to him, O oh monk, we worship your feet. So the Blessed One took no notice since he was liberated by the utter ending of the essentials of existence. That's the Upadi that we mentioned earlier today. And they are, uh, the essentials of existence are karma, sense desire, kamma, action, kilesa, defilements, and kanda, the five aggregates. All keys. All Those are the basis of existence. Kile karma, sense desire, kamma, action, kilesa, defilement, and Kanda, the, the mind and body aggregates. Upadi. U P A D H I. Upadi. Okay, so they go through the same routine as they did before, and with the same effect as they did in the other text. So, then they have some interesting kind of turnaround as the daughters start to get interested in the Dhamma. Do you now dream in woods, immersed in sorrow? Have you lost your wealth? Are you pining for it? Is there some crime committed by you in the town? Why do you make no friends amongst the people? Is there none that you can call a friend? I have defeated all the serried hosts of pleasant luring forms. I have found bliss pondering alone. The bliss of the goal attained. The bliss that lies in the quiet of the heart. So this is what the Buddha outlines as, Look, I'm not interested in your kind of pleasure. Yeah, because the pleasure that I found is something that is far, far beyond anything that you people can, can offer. And there's, there's a, a um, in the Magandhya Sutta, is it? In the, Majima, in the middle length sayings, there's a, um, when someone is asking, the, is asking the Buddha about sense pleasure, he says, in just as heavenly pleasures are much greater than world, earthly pleasures, you know, the, the pleasure of someone in the high heavens is, is much, much greater than the pleasure of, of someone on earth, 
so too the the, the pleasure that I, I experience uh, through the through enlightenment is far far greater than anything you can experience in a heavenly realm so it's not because I'm not I'm not into pleasure it's because I, I am into pleasure that I'm not the slightest bit interested in <laughs> what you do with bodies you know it just doesn't doesn't match it's just not not even interesting it doesn't hold a candle to the sun the bliss that lies in the quiet of the heart so I do not seek friends amongst the people and there is none with whom I need to make friends and Arati spoke to him in stanzas what abiding does a bhikkhu practice here that having crossed over the fi- of five of the floods that the sixth he may cross two that's the five senses and then the sixth is the, the, the mind sense what meditation practice forbids sense pleasures access to him so she's getting interested like how do you do this anyway I mean no one else can stand up to us a lot we kind of tie the whole thing on as, as, uh, as well as we can you're not even bothered and then here is a really good summary of the right attitude for meditation this little passage here at the top of this page tranquil in body with liberated mind contriving nothing mindful and detached knowing Dhamma, absorbed without thought roving, unangry and unanxious, unperplexed. Such abiding does a bhikkhu practice here. Those are really good principles to, to note. Tranquil in body, so physically relaxed, with liberated mind, you're not in a kind of compulsive, got to do, got to get, got to get rid of state. Contriving nothing, that means like a puncture or a conceptual proliferation so you're not you're not um, the mind isn't full of, of um, wanting this or wanting that or, or directing the consciousness in a in a in a uh, pre-conditioned way mindful and detached knowing the Dhamma absorbed without thought roving so the mind is focused without the kind of mind chattering unangry and unanxious without aversion without fear unperplexed and without confusion so this is a basic summary of right attitude such abiding does a bhikkhu practice here that having crossed over five of the floods the sixth he may cross two such meditation practice forbids sense pleasures access to him so he's really reading, revealing to her look this is how I do it you, know. you want to know how you can't get in this is it you know. so he doesn't hold anything back he has no secrets even from his, the people who are uh, aggressing against him then Raga uttered these stanzas in the Blessed One's presence. With craving severed, he goes in company. Numbers of beings will follow him, alas. And there are multitudes the unattached will filch from the realm of death and lead ashore. The great heroes, the perfect ones, lead men away by the good Dhamma. What jealous spite of ours ev- avails against <coughs> the good Dhamma's guiding power? Then Tanha, Arati, and Raga, Mara's daughters, went to Mara, the evil one. Seeing them coming, he uttered these stanzas. Fools, you have tried to split a rock by poking it with lily stems, to dig a hill out with your nails, to chew up iron with your teeth, to find a footing on a cliff with a great stone upon your head, to push a tree down with your chest, and so you come from Gotama frustrated. So in this strange kind of perverted way, Mara has become a kind of, see I told you, you know, this guy is, <laughs> he's, he's become a kind of almost like a, Revere of the Buddha's power, that he's kind of, he's um, uh, so uh, um, strong the impression the Buddha made on him that he's he's kind of um, almost advocating the Buddha's spiritual capacities, and um, and there's this sort of strange kind of admiration between Mara and his daughters, and so as you can also. In, in sometimes you know, relate to that when the when the, the mind is very clear and strong and, and you, you, you need the, the desires or anxieties or, or aversions have been you know, popping up and, and the mind is very clear and, and well established and, and unfooled by any of that and it's almost like you can feel the sense of oh well alright then <laughs> you win you know but uh, the, the desire mind caves in before the, the wisdom mind and and you can say, and you can almost sort of feel that sense of, okay, well, I'll just stop bothering for the time being, you know, but, but I'll wait. <laughs> I'll wait for the next opportunity, but, but okay, you take this round. And almost like the, then sort of the desire, the, the kind of restless desire mind that kind of 
that's this craving kind of just kind of falls away for a time and allows the, the wisdom mind, the, the pure mind to just uh, operate freely. So are there any, any questions before we... There's another couple of sections I'd like to do this evening. So any comments or questions or points to make on all of that? So, and we go to another version. This is from a, a more ancient translation. This is Henry Clark Warren from the 1890s in the Harvard Oriental series. Um, this is slightly more antique language, but this is where we get the um, the earth-touching mudra comes in. In this particular, in, this is one of the versions that this comes in. Mara being thus unable with these nine storms of wind, rain, rocks, weapons, live coals, hot ashes, sand, mud and darkness to drive away the future Buddha, gave command to his followers, Look ye now, why stand ye still? Seize, kill, drive away this prince. And arming himself with a discus and seated upon the shoulders of the elephant called girded with mountains, he drew near the future Buddha and said, Siddhartha, arise from this seat. It does not belong to you but to me. When the great being heard this, he said, Mara, you have not fulfilled the ten perfections in any of their three grades, nor have you made the five great donations, nor have you striven for knowledge, nor for the welfare of the world, nor for enlightenment. The seat does not belong to you, but to me. The ten perfections were the, those spiritual um, virtues I mentioned yesterday? Today? <laughs> Sometime. I think it was earlier today. Um, the paramitas, uh, generosity, virtue, renunciation, uh, energy, wisdom, uh, resolution, uh, determina uh, determination, uh, patience, uh, kindness, equanimity and honesty. That's it, yeah. <laughs> and the five great donations, you made a note of those? Yes. Treasure, child, wife, fool, wife and ring. Oh, so in the ve that was from the Vaisantra Jataka? That's the entire Jataka. Is it worth going to give me a quick summary of that? Um, maybe a quick summary. Yeah. Uh, the Vaisantra Jataka is filled with the the last human life of the Buddha before uh, he went to the Tarotis to heaven and then became the Buddha. And he perfected the last of the Dharma, he perfected the, the uh, generosity of Dhamma Bharati in, in his life. Uh, I'll, I'll just go through this very quickly. Um, he, he determined he had, at a young age, he was a prince, and he determined at a young age that he was going to be absolutely generous and never refuse making a gift. And of course, uh, all sorts of things happened. He was given a, a white elephant, and then uh, he gave that away, and that angered the, the people of the kingdom. So they sent him, uh, uh, they, they sent him away um, from the kingdom, and he went away with his wife and, and his two children, two boys, off on uh, to live in the woods. And on the way, he gave away all his possessions, his chariot, his horses, and, his, and then he went on foot to some little hut. And then uh, a Brahmin came and, and asked to have the two children to take away a slave, and, and uh, uh, he, he gave them to the uh, Brahmin. And the Brahmin drove them along the road with a stick, and they were weeping, wailing. And uh, uh, one of the gods, that uh, Saka, wanted to protect that, protect the wife. He knew that some some evil doer would come and demand the wife, so he materialized in human form. And demanded to take the wife away the slave and he was going to protect her. So the wife went off and, and um, then it has, it has kind of a, a, a happy ending in that he gets, he gets, he 
really fascinated to me when he gets he gets the, uh, all of his, his wife and children back and that evil brand who was used to children back from horrible deaths. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, when, they, when the Buddha... Chokes on his own vomit, I think. Uh, yeah, he overeats, and, 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 overeats and, and chokes on his own vomit. And, uh, and then the, uh, the, San, the Sanchara, when he takes back his kingdom, I mean, he, he, he gets away, he, he wonders how he's going to possibly be able to satisfy everyone who his reputation of generosity and the god brings showers of gold and jewels on his conscience and gives them all away and he lets all the all the cats that go from the, from the jail including the cat that's the story of the conqueror uh, the last uh, last human verse is with us what, what's his name in that line? the conqueror the conqueror the conqueror yeah, yeah. It's a kind of national myth of in Thailand. They they have a sort of ceremonial replaying of it every year. It's a kind of huge festival. It takes about I think about eighteen hours, or sometimes they do an hour a day for about three weeks. And um, it, it used to be performed in the monasteries, and then then the monks would recite the whole Jataka. It takes about eighteen hours from beginning to end. It was a great thing to be able to recite the whole story, and then different uh, or and then different people would play the parts of the different characters and the, the, the choice part is always the evil Brahmin, Jujika. People love being Jujika, like the kind of the wicked, nasty. It's so creepy and horrible. And then when the kids, the kids get driven away, then everyone in the audience cries. <laughs> and it happens, it's the same story every year and everyone weeps in the same places. And then when Jujika is, uh, he, um, he, when finally he gets his just desserts, everyone, cheer, everyone cheers. There's this hilarious scene where he's, cut, he's married to this beautiful young girl and then um, she goes off somewhere. Um, uh, she leaves the room in the middle of the night and then, and then this huge python comes into his bed. And then he's lying in bed stroking this pipe and saying, Oh, Amita Da, Amita Da, your skin is so smooth and lovely. And <laughs> this huge great snake that he's cuddling. <laughs> And then finally he overeats and chokes on his own vomit and everyone goes, yeah! <laughs> so the, these five, um, five great donations were the, who was the, what, the elephant? The white elephant, the state elephant? Well, the five, the five donations according to the footnote were treasure, child, wife, rule, wife and women. Hmm. So it doesn't have to be a specific story. It wouldn't be Vaisantra, then it would be the different, different Jatakas. Because he, there were the times when he, he threw himself off the cliff to feed the hungry tigers. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't give life in this story. No. Yeah. Okay. So, um, unable to restrain his fury, the enraged Mara now hurled his discus, but the great being reflected on the ten perfections and the discus changed into a canopy of flowers and remained suspended over his head. Yet they say that this keen-edged discus, when at other times Mara hurled it in anger, would cut through solid stone pillars as if they had been tips of bamboo shoots. On this occasion it became a canopy of flowers. And this again is a, an interesting principle to reflect on, that when we are completely still within ourselves, even when people hurl hatred at us, if we neither reject them or, be, or, or resist, or get angry, or upset, or self-justifying, when the, the, there's a complete stillness and selflessness, then hatred gets turned into um, beauty. And it's by, through the, the power of awakened intention, and, and uh, like, that awakenedness, the, the pure intention, and also the, the uh, determination not to contend, then and you know, I think we all experience that where people get angry with us or get upset, and when we we are completely still within ourselves, and that kind of anger can't has got nothing to get a purchase on, and then it's almost like you're a mirror for that person, and they they feel they kind of see their own ugliness or their own state, and it's got the anger's got nothing to land on, so that like it kind of bounces back, like seeing their own reflection, and it can't sustain itself, and then they say. Oh, Sorry about that. I you know, kind of got carried away there. Um, didn't really mean it. And they kind of want to offer you gifts and, and flowers and presents and apologies. And <laughs> so, 
So this kind of um, principle is at play here. Followers of Mara began hurling immense mountain crags, saying, this will make him get up from his seat and flee. But the great being kept his thoughts on the ten perfections, and the crags became wreaths of flowers and then fell to the ground. Now the gods, meanwhile, were standing on the rim of the world and craning their necks to look, saying, oh, woe the day! Oh, no! The handsome form of Prince Siddhartha will surely be destroyed. What will, we, what will he do to save himself? And the great being, after his assertion that the seat which the future Buddhas had always used on the day of their complete enlightenment mm-hmm. belonged to him, continued and said, so this is, you know, this is the immovable spot where all Buddhas are enlightened, Mara, who is witness to your having given donations? Said Mara, all these, as many as you see here, these are my witnesses. And he outstretched his hand in the direction of his army, and instantly from Mara's army came a roar, I'm his witness, I'm his witness. Bunch of liars. Which was like the roar of an earthquake. Then Mara said to the great being, Siddhartha, who is witness to your having given donations? Your witnesses, replied the great being, are animate beings, and I have no animate witnesses present. However, not to mention the donation which I gave in other existences, the 700-fold donation which I gave in my Vesantra existence shall now be testified to by the solid earth, inanimate though she be. And drawing forth his right hand from beneath his priestly robe, he stretched it out towards the mighty earth and said, Are you witness or are you not to my having given a great 700-fold donation in my Vesantra existence? And the mighty earth thundered, I bear you witness, with a hundred, a thousand, a hundred thousand roars as if to overwhelm the army of Mara. Now while the great being was thus calling to mind the donation he gave in his Vesantra existence and saying to himself, Siddhartha, that was a great and excellent donation which you gave, the hundred and fifty league high elephant called girded with mountains fell upon his knees before the great being. And the followers of Mara fled away in all directions. No two went the same way. But leaving their head ornaments and their cloaks behind, they fled straight before them. And the hosts of the gods, when they saw the army of Mara flee, cried out, Mara is defeated. Prince Siddhartha has conquered. Let us go and celebrate the victory. The, the Davidians are always eager for a party. You know. <laughs> <laughs> See at the top of this one? So they're having a real boogie. Kind of banners and bells and and stringed instruments and the Buddha's teaching the Dhamma and the Devas going yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you notice they don't listen to the Dhamma they're too busy partying <laughs> there's this expression in the Pali like Sabe Deva Mahamulanti which uh, the Venerable Ananda Maitreya translated as these devatas they are utterly foolish fellows <laughs> <laughs> And the snakes, this is the, the Nagas, the dragons, egging on the, the Nagas, egging, egging on the Nagas, the Garudas, uh, egging on the Garudas, the deities, uh, the deities and the Brahma angels, the Brahma angels. They came with perfumes, garlands and other offerings in the hands of the great being on the throne of wisdom. And as they came, the victory now hath this illustrious Buddha won, the wicked one, the slayer, hath defeated been. Thus round the throne of wisdom shouted joyously the bands of Nagas, the songs of victory for the sage. The victory now hath this illustrious Buddha won, the wicked one, the slayer, hath defeated been, thus round the throne of wisdom shouted joyously the flocks of birds, that would be the Garudas, their songs of victory for the sage. The victory now hath this illustrious Buddha won, the wicked one, the slayer, hath defeated been, thus round the throne of wisdom shouted joyously the bands of gods, their songs of victory for the sage. The victory now hath this illustrious Buddha won, the wicked one, the slayer, hath defeated been, thus round the throne of wisdom, shouted joyously the Brahma angels, songs of victory for the saint. And the god, Mara, discomforted together with his army, disappeared. Heaven, luminous with the light of the full moon, then shone like the smile of a maid, showering flowers, the petals of flowers, bouquets of flowers, freshly wet with dew on the blessed one, so that night, during the remainder of the night, in the first watch of that wonderful night, acquired the knowledge of his previous existence, and the second watch acquired the divine eye, and the last watch fathomed the law of dependent origination, and at sunrise attained omniscience. Now even though it is 
late in the day, I, um, due to another uh, editorial error, I uh, had intended this next passage to come here. And I would like to go through this as a kind of final point to this whole section. So this next bit by from uh, the Masters of God, Oriental Mythology. The earth quaked in its delight, like a woman thrilled. Gods descended from every side to worship the Blessed One that was now the Buddha, the wake. O oh, glory to thee, illuminate hero among men, they sang, and they walked around him in reverential sunrise ambulation. That was a classical way of showing respect, was to walk three times round clockwise. And the demons of the earth, even the sons and daughters of Mara, the deities who roam the sky and those who walk the ground all arrived and after worshipping the victor with various forms of homage suitable to their stations they returned radiant with a new rapture to their sundry abodes and uh, Joseph Campbell's reflections here I think are, are very very useful um, for the most part so in sum the Buddha in his dis dissolution of the sense of I had moved in consciousness back past the motivation of creation which, however, did not mean that he had ceased to live. Indeed, he was to remain half a century longer within the world of time and space. This is, and this is a great phrase here. Participating with irony in the void of this manifold, in the emptinesses of this multifarious world, seeing duality yet knowing it to be deceptive, compassionately teaching what cannot be taught, to others who were not really other. <laughs> I think by, by the time we reach this point, that's kind of easy to, a, a paradox easy to live with. For there is no way to communicate an experience in words to those who have not already had the experience, or at least something somewhat like it, to be referred to by analogy. Furthermore, where there is no ego, there is no other, either to be feared, to be desired, or to be taught. Now, this is some interesting points here. In the classical Indian doctrine of the four ends for which men are supposed to live and strive, love and pleasure, karma, power and success, artha, lawful order and moral virtue, dharma, and finally release from delusion, moksha, these are like the four goals of life in a sort of traditional Hindu um, practice and tradition. We know that the first two are manifestations of what Freud has termed the pleasure principle, primary urges of the natural man, epitomized in the formula, I want. In the adult, according to the oriental view, these are to be quelled and checked by the principles of Dharma, which in the classical Indian system are impressed upon the individual by the training of his caste. The infantile I want is to be subdued by a thou shalt, socially applied, not individually determined. I mean, like the society determines what is the right thing for you to do. Which is supposed to be as much a part of the immutable cosmic order as the course of the sun itself. Now, it's to be observed that in the version just presented of the temptation of the Buddha, the antagonist, that's Mara, the adversary, represents all three of the first triad of ends, the so-called Trivarga, the aggregate of three. For in his character as the Lord of Desire, he personifies the first, as the Lord of Death, the aggressive force of the second, while in his summons to the meditating sage to arise and return to the duties of his station in society, he promotes the third. And indeed, as a manifestation of that self, which not only poured forth but permanently supports the universe, that's back at the beginning of this section with the, the I am in the, in the great void, you remember? And indeed, as a manifestation of that self, which not only poured forth but permanently supports the universe, he is the proper incarnation of these ends, for they do, in fact, support the world. And in most of the rites of all religions, this triune God, we may say, in one aspect or another, is the one and only God adored. However, in the name and achievement of the Buddha, the illuminate, illuminated one, the fourth end is announced, released from all delusion. And to the attainment of this, the others are impediments, difficult to remove yet for one of purpose not invincible. 
sitting at the world navel, the axis of the world, the immovable spot, pressing back through the welling creative force that was surging into and through his own being, like the golden bowl moving up the stream. The Buddha actually broke back into the void beyond and, ironically, the universe immediately burst into bloom. Sitting at the world navel, pressing back through the welling creative force that was surging into and through his own being, the Buddha actually broke back into the void beyond and, ironically, the universe immediately burst into bloom. Now this is, um, I think of all the, this entire book of Joseph Campbell, I think this is my favorite favorite clause. That the Buddha broke back into the void and ironically the world burst into bloom. Now this, this represents an extremely important principle of which that I know that we've covered a lot today but this is, this is something that I feel is very important for understanding like, the, the very basis of Buddhist practice. So, what we have here in this, the, this uh, image of the attainment of enlightenment, you have the, the Buddha touching the earth. The earth mother, as I was mentioning in the, in the general iconography, she produces this flood from her hair and, and washes away the armies of Mara and then once they've been defeated, then they, they come back and they're offering flowers and gifts and so forth. And um, so there's this paradox that you know, the Buddha had to call upon the, the help of the, the Earth Mother to, uh, to complete the act of transcendence. In order to transcend the world completely, he had to, to touch the world. He had to, in order to completely let go of the, of the, of the phenomenal world, he has to reach out and touch it. This is an, a very significant principle. Because you think like detachment would um, means like having nothing to do with something. But what this is pointing to, um, the, the detachment is not the same as not touching the earth or, or blanking out the world or having shutting off the senses or having nothing to do with the world. In fact, like the, the, the ironic thing, like you know, the Buddha breaks back into the void and the earth bursts into bloom. It's like that the perfection of detachment requires touching the earth. It actually necessitates it. Unless, uh, unless there's that, that um, there is that reaching out from that infinite void to connect that to the phenomenal world, then the detachment is not complete. It's just a kind of avoidance, um, a non-engagement. So like, there's only half the picture there. And in, in a way, this is, it, is a, so is, what it's pointing to is that the enlightenment is not just a mental event, but it's intrinsically related to the, and unified with the, the phenomenal world of, of people and things, of, of the body, the personality, and the, the surrounding world. So that it's not just something that's, that's psychological, but it's intrinsically related to the, to the material world. And it's only when the, the Buddha has that kind of makes that gesture uh, and, and a humility of calling upon the, the earth goddess to, to come and bear him witness. Until he does that, Mara's not going to go. You know, it's the, fight, you know, the, the thing's not going to be over. So he has to reach out, like reaching out of the void, touching the earth and calling forth the earth as a witness. And then, you know, and then the, it's only when there is like, if you like, the symbolic kind of honoring and recognition of, yes, there is nobody here, nothing has existed from the beginning, there's nobody born, there's nobody who dies, um, and this is the absolute reality. But still, personalities and, and hungers and, and fear and, and uh, attraction and aversion still exist in the world. There is the body, there's the personality, there's the family. And even if you know you don't exist, you know, your mother and father certainly think that you do. <laughs> or your brother and sister, or at least your spouse or partner or your children. Your creditors, in fact, yes. There's no, it doesn't work to tell, to tell uh, American Express that you do not exist. I could be that column, if I reach the state of non-self, so don't call me. Right. It's like getting on a bus when you're on a, uh, on a 
don't know. Really on this bus. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, I often liken it to getting on a bus when you're on an acid trip and, and uh, you're in the middle of some kind of cosmic experience, you know, and you're sort of in this kind of you know, psychedelic uh, realization of, of ultimate unity and you climb on the bus and and the, the bus driver says, you know, 20 pence please, and you say, do you know who you are? <laughs> 20 pence please. Uh, you are the ultimate reality. <laughs> Look, give me 20 pence and get off the bus. <laughs> These do sound painfully familiar experiences, don't they? (laughs) 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 So, uh, so what's contained in this 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 image and this kind of relationship is um, is really important because it's only through that kind of humility and recognizing the connection between the the ultimate reality and the conventional reality (coughs) and the the interdependence of the two and not trying to hang on to the ultimate and ignore the relative or hanging on to the relative and and ignoring the ultimate which is what Mara is trying to do it's only by the recognition of the both of both of them that um, that uh, there is this kind that fulfillment is arrived at and um, it's also interesting how you know this is often is depicted as like the battle with Mara, but also you know that you realise that the the, 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 Bu- the the Buddha conquers, if you like, the Buddha is the conqueror, because he refuses to fight, he refuses to be me in opposition to this, and that um, the uh, uh, and if you call it the battle with Mara, then it turns time and <coughs> self and the world into the enemy. So that even phrasing it in that way kind of sets up the wrong models for us, and that it's it's actually more like the, you know the battle of Mara, or Mara Mara's attempt at a battle, but the, you know, the Buddha's absolute clarity of of non-contention, of of um, non-discrimination, is what dispels uh, the, the forces of delusion. Now, wh- how that relates, how this kind of um, Relationship between the um, the realization of truth and its relationship to the phenomenal world—that kind of humility of recognizing our limitations, uh, our, our body, our personality, our relationship with the world—it's um, also interesting because uh, I've, I've been contemplating this a lot, and then reading this last paragraph uh, of um, or the last section here of, of Joseph Campbell's piece. There's this kind of obsession that we have in the West, that, and this comes through a, a lot of, of Joseph Campbell's work, with the the kind of special, the specialness of the individual, and that uh, particularly since the, the 50s and 60s, there's been this this obsession that we have about the individual trapped by convention, or trapped by society, or trapped by the institution, trapped by the system, and and we have developed a lot of you know a lot of the energy of the 60s came out of the individual breaking free from the system, and and like, and the longing for freedom of like me, free from being trapped and limited by, by the institution and, and um, the kind of stuff that that we were all reading and what the society worshipped was very much around this, this idea and this kind of, um, like much of what what Kafka wrote, like things like the castle or um, uh, the trial. It's like you know the the the, uh, the individual trapped by the system, the um, things like Nazis and Goldman, and uh, the glass bead game by Hermann Hesse, and uh, um, books like uh, uh, Gormenghast by Mervyn Peake, the Gormenghast trilogy uh, by him. Um, you know many uh, many many and various like Rebel Without a Cause. These kind of you know, the, the, the kind of icons, or iconic icons for our, our time, and that it certainly launched a lot of people to kind of to break out of a, an oppressive system. 
But what it always seems to, to lead us to, and what culturally we, we kind of inherited in the West nowadays, is, is this idea that, you know, if only I could be free, and we tend to blame the world, or blame the system, or blame the convention, or the institution for trapping me. And there's always this, uh, there's this kind of, wouldn't it be nice if it was all over, or if I didn't have to bother with this? And that our, our sense of freedom is always being um, written in terms of, of getting away from certain influences or certain things that are kind of inhibiting me. And it's and also that you know with with the our motivation for meditation is often like, wouldn't it be nice if I, I I'm meditating now? I'm really putting in my dues now so that I won't have to bother later on. Wouldn't it be nice not to have to bother? I mean, does this sound familiar? Mm-hmm that, you know, we kind of, uh, there's a certain sense of, well, if I didn't have to, I wouldn't bother doing this. But, you know, because it's needed, I, I do it. And that, in the sort of the, it's like the, the kind of the weekend mentality, you know, thank God it's Friday, I'm waiting for my next holiday, a time off. And we're always kind of waiting for the break or looking at what's present and here as, as a kind of an imposition on my freedom. We're trying to get to the free space where, where life will be good. And obviously there's a certain, to a certain degree that has validity. But if we build our, our, our spiritual life around that, then we're always waiting for the you know, sense impingement or the duties or responsibilities or, or contact with people or the world to be cleared out of the way. That's the kind of intruder. That's the thing that's kind of clogging up my world. And uh, what this principle is, is pointing to is something very, very different. Like in e- even this, um, so this passage from um, Joseph Campbell, where he says, um, "Such an act of self naughting is one of individual effort. There could be no question about that. However, an Occidental eye cannot but observe that there is no requirement or expectation anywhere in this Indian system of four ends, neither in the primary two of the natural organism and the impressed third of society, nor in the exalted fourth of release." for a maturation of the personality through intelligent, fresh, individual adjustment to the time-space world roundabout. Okay. Uh, again, a maturation of the personality through intelligent, fresh, individual adjustment to the time-space world roundabout. Creative experimentation with unexplored possibilities and the assumption of personal responsibility for unprecedented acts performed within the context of the social order. It's like, you know, all the good things that the individual can do. You know, the good things about individuality is outlining that. In the Indian tradition, all has been perfectly arranged from all eternity. There can be nothing new, nothing to be learned, but what the sages have taught from of, from of yore. And finally, when the boredom of this nursery horizon of I want against thou shalt has become insufferable, the fourth and final aim is all that is offered of an extinction of the infantile ego altogether, disengagement or release, moksha, from both I and thou. Now, in my not-so-humble opinion, he has really missed the point. I don't know if you could follow that, maybe it's a bit late in the day. But um, what, is, what he's saying is that, that you know, the, the Eastern traditions, then the, the individual is not given the kind of full flush of potential that the individual truly has. And in the Western tradition, we have praised the individual. You know, this is, this is the land of the rugged individualist, and uh, so on and so forth. And, that, and his contention is that, you know, because of our, our emphasis and the mythology of the individual, the hero going out and seeking fortune and so on, and the individual excellence, then there's some dimension that's being revealed or cultivated that you don't get where in the Asian tradition where there's kind of there's this kind of um, all you get is self effacement and the kind of the, the ego is wiped out and you just sort of merge with the absolute and it's all over, isn't that nice? You can just you deliqu- deliquesce into in, into in infinite omniscience. And um, but this is uh, I think this is a really a gross misunderstanding because the, you know, the experience of, of Buddhist practice is not that the, that the individual is by any means not fulfilling you know, unprecedented potentials and uh, unprecedented acts performed within the context of the social order. Creative experimentation with unexplored possibilities, running workshops on the Buddha's enlightenment, 
individual adjustment to the time-space world round about, you know, intelligent, fresh individual adjustment. I mean, this is all very much part of the, the Buddhist practice and the Buddhist path. But it's just the, the, the ego identity is not exalted. And it's also, it's not seen as, in what you're doing is in letting go of the self-illusion. It, and, and even though he outlines this insight himself, that, you know, that the, the Buddha breaks back into the void and the earth bursts into bloom, it's like the earth bursts into bloom, this represents the, the total fulfillment of the, of the human condition. And that when, when there's a, re- a true realization, a true liberation, then it's like, it's a recognition that the world was never a prison. The body and the personality and, and the world of time and space, this was never a prison. It's like, you know, is the wave trying to break free of the sea? You know, is the wave entrapped by the sea? You know, is, is the wave unfulfilled because it hasn't broken away from the sea and done its own thing? You know, or the, um, is space at war with form? You know, is the space and form it coexist? They're not, it's not the kind of argument between the two. Or does, um, is, uh, you know, is dawn trapped by being stuck in, in, in the cycle of, of the day, of 24 hours? Or is, uh, is the timeless now interfered with by the march of, of minutes and hours? You know, the now is not, is not bothered by how many hours and minutes and microseconds march through it because it, it, it's, it's a totally different dimension that they, the passage of time and the timeless reality they, are, they do not interfere with each other so that the whole concept, the, the construct of, of the individual that is, is created uh, and kind of revered in the West you know, it seems to be that um, we kind of exalt that in a way and think that unless we do have this kind of fixed construct of identity, then we will not, somehow we'll miss fulfilling our potential and that the, what he's presenting here is that the Asian tradition, in the Asian traditions, it's a kind of, you just sort of dissolve into this sort of amorphous mush of ultimate reality. But it, 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 I, what I, I can see in the Buddha's teaching this and the, the images here that are in the practice is that that's not the, the case at all, that that in fact the, the, the absolute fulfillment of our potential as human beings is brought about through the, this, um, this, uh, through the recognition of, of ultimate reality. It's not negating um, our individual capacities and talents and ingenuity and, and imagination at all. It is actually the means whereby that is most uh, freely actualized. And that when we do that, when that is done, then our experience of, of um, engagement with the world is, is, is complete and that the, um, it's, it's also significant that the, the, the Buddha having arrived at this quality of transcendence then one of the results of that, one of the qualities of the Buddha is called vijacharana sampano, perfection in knowledge and conduct so that the, when the heart is completely released and completely unattached to the world, then there is not only a perfection of knowledge, but intrinsic in that, actually in the same word, the word isn't even broken, vijja charana sampano. Uh, vijja is knowledge, charana is action. So it's not only is the, is the, the wisdom and the, the knowledge perfected, but that is intrinsically related to action in the world, so that the, the actions that, that, and, and the words that stem from that, 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 that void are totally in accord, totally harmonized with the, the external world. So that it's, um, it's not as though, the, like, like, the, like the analogies I was using, that that ultimate quality can be obstructed or interfered with or inhibited by what we do. But actually when, that's, when that ultimate nature is realized, that's when we do perfectly. So I just would like to offer these thoughts for you to reflect on and um, I think there's probably been enough words today but uh, if anyone does have any other things they want to say or clarify this evening we can manage an inquiry. I think we're probably all fairly well 
spike by now. Mm-hmm. I have two figures, and I just wanted to mention that uh, I get concerned when I hear Buddhist teaching. Uh, but it's good for the individual to take all the responsibility and to keep the focus on the individual of missing some of the uh, corrosive structures in the society around us, which really are assaulting individuals uh, in this culture and around the world. I don't. I, I'm not sure where that balance is, and there's been a debate in America for a long time about, you know, we'll change the society to structural reform uh, at the macro societal level, or individually we'll all become more moral human beings, and by doing that we will shake off the oppressive structures of our culture. And that debate's been going on for a century or so, yeah. so it's on in political circles. And uh, so I just want to um, just throw that out there when we talk about yeah. tonight. But it's, you see, the thing, the thing is, it's like that kind of realization does not turn us into passive zombies. You see, rather than I mean, where, where we kind of tend to approach from freedom is like wanting to be free from responsibility. Like, the, you know, the, we want to be kind of free, like to not have to bother. But what I'm talking about is actually the freedom is, uh, the real freedom is the freedom to be totally responsive. So that when the heart is free, then you can respond totally to the environment and you can, whatever can be given is given, whatever needs to be done is done, whatever structures that the society needs to move towards a healthier state, then that they most effectively arise from that, that you know, clear knowing mind. And so that it's like, that is the, the you know, the, the principle whereby we can, we can deal with the ills of the society most uh, most fully. But by interacting with being an activist, for example, or trying to struggle with problems, whether that's wise or foolish, um, in my experience, it tears my practice to shreds. You know, I, I drop down to the level of whoever it is that I'm dealing with and fighting or opposing. And I, uh, I don't know how to, and I just say, well, I'm going to somehow withdraw from this struggle, at least for the time being. I don't know how to interact. I can touch the earth, but to put my hands on the hot stove of American society, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's pretty painful. I don't know how to balance that interaction and maintain. How do you, to maintain the free time for the clarity of practice and the other virtues associated with it? and to still kind of wrestle uh, or be in process with worldly structures. Boy, I tell you, that takes my ass from here, you know, hard to square, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's just important to realize, yeah, these are real problems, but they can't be kind of wished away by abstractions. I just want to, maybe they can be, I just haven't thought about it. Yeah, it's not an abstraction. You know, well, I'm going I, you know, we, we talk about these things not because they're, they're kind of nice sort of religious principles that, 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 sound, that sound good, but because this is what actually makes a difference in life. Otherwise, I wouldn't say it. You know, these are the things that actually make the difference, I would say. And so that's why, you know, the, the, you, you, they're brought up and outlined so that that we can actually transform the way that we function so that our lives can be, be more e- effective and, and fulfilled in every way. So, you know, if they're not effective in changing us, then they're, they're pointless, they're, they, they haven't served their purpose. Some of it comes back to something you said earlier this afternoon that um, I've always assumed that the world needs to be changed because of injustice, pain, and suffering, especially the destruction of the innocent. My cardinal assumption has always been that that's wrong and that needs to be changed. But maybe that's 
the wrong view. Maybe the world doesn't need to be changed at all. And by accepting it and embracing it completely as it is, paradoxically, it also becomes transformed. Yeah, I really, you know, uh, so I hope that's clear. One thing you said there, I was like a chord, you, you said earlier on, um, uh, you, you touched on, I can't remember your exact words, but you touched on the danger of becoming the thing you're fighting. Uh, and that's a, that's a real, that's something really to watch. That's where practicing and coming from a strong center of yourself and being purified being yourself is absolutely essential because it's, uh, when, when you're active against injustice and, and whatever, I mean, you, the classic example is the uh, peace peace uh, marchers who are full of rage. You know, it's, uh, I mean, it's, uh, that doesn't mean you have to be inert and inactive, but you have. It's just you have to come from a pure center yourself. And I remember the um, the, the Dhammapada that love, uh, hate is never conquered by hate. Hate is only conquered by love. You know, I'm not. You know, it's not easy. I know it's not easy at all. It's a very tricky path to walk. Maybe if hundreds of thousands of people become fully enlightened through this process or similar processes in other cultures, that somehow that will also shift the axis of the world. Uh, that's another thought that may be worthwhile. Well, maybe we can sit for a couple of minutes. Thank you.